The term productivity theater refers to efforts aimed at trying to look busy and productive while not actually accomplishing anything of value. Said another way, it is performative rather than practical work. This term has long been used to describe the sort of frantic, on the ball, sitting up straight and working on a spreadsheet tizzy that people go into when their manager walks into the room or when they're otherwise trying to visually demonstrate their value to their employer but it's taken on a new angle with the increase in remote work situations. It's more difficult to show your manager or whomever you directly report to that you are busy and good at your job and should therefore be retained and maybe promoted rather than marked for firing when you are in different places. On the other side of that effort, it's becoming more difficult for managers to keep tabs on their direct reports the way they would generally do when those reports are working in the same physical space as they are. Consequently, a cottage industry of remote worker surveillance technology has sprung up, fed and amplified by the desire of these higher-ups to keep tabs on those they are managing, even from several time zones away, if necessary. One of the more hands-on methods of keeping tabs, which could itself be construed as performative labor by managers for their bosses, is holding a lot more virtual meetings and making sure everyone participates in online conversations via Slack, Zoom, and similar platforms. The numbers are all over the place here, but one analysis by the Harvard Business Review found that there are now about 60% more virtual meetings per employee than before the pandemic, and many of the benefits of working from home would seem to be disappearing because of the increased time and presence demands associated with all these check-ins and virtual meetups. There's a lot more burnout and less work-life balance due to this increase in virtual checkups. A sort of moral panic centering on the concept of quiet quitting, where employees continue to collect a paycheck but do as little work as they can get away with because they are psychologically burned out and checked out, done with the job, just waiting to be let go, has also led to more direct surveillance of worker computers, often using software that tracks mouse clicks and or keyboard activity to do so, which is pretty invasive, but also justified by many managers who use such tech because they are, again, trying to justify their own continued employment to their higher-ups by demonstrating that they've got this. They can keep all their reports chugging along like before. This heightened sense of being watched all the time by what's become known as bossware has led to even more burnout, but also expanded another technology sub-industry consisting of what are often called automatic mouse movers or automatic mouse jigglers, which are exactly what they sound like. Hardware that keeps your mouse physically moving which can trick surveillance software required by your employer into thinking that you are doing things on your computer all day, even if you're away eating or using the restroom or watching TV. This lack of trust by employers toward their employees seems to have led to a concomitant lack of trust from employees toward their employers, which has heightened tensions and further increased burnout and time-wasting performative work, while also raising more questions about the staying power of remote work post-height of the COVID pandemic. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. The work-from-home revolution, how that revolution is going mid-2023, and why many employers are stepping back from earlier plans to allow their employees to work from home forever. <laughs> You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. You can also become a member at understandery.com, or you can find a slew of one-off support options at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everyone who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. Mm -hmm. 
As I mentioned in a recent episode about debt, the owners of office buildings have been going through it of late, suffering first the initial consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, which left them with a lot of empty office real estate as companies went out of business and downsized or implemented temporary work-from-home orders, which was then followed by the deployment of, at times, industry-wide, longer-term remote work programs that winnowed these real estate companies' customer base down to a fraction of what it was mere years before. As of the day I'm recording this, in late June 2023, tech world businesses are continuing to dump their offices at a high rate, and some of the, until recently, big hubs for tech world offices in places like San Jose and Palo Alto are seeing office vacancy rates that are up 6% from their 2019 numbers. And that's after a small exodus back to the office that has been sparked by upper management in some of these Silicon Valley-based tech companies over the past half year or so. That means about 17% of offices in these areas are still vacant right now, compared to around 11% in 2019, a pretty substantial shortfall that's causing all sorts of issues within the real estate market. Some of these real estate companies are having trouble servicing the debt they used to buy these buildings, and that's meant a bit of a panic in some regions that a wave of real estate bankruptcies might be impending, leading to fears about shortfalls, but also the introduction of business-favoring discounts for companies willing and able to fill up these spaces. Those discounts are no doubt appreciated, but that does not seem to be the primary incentive powering a return-to-office push by many business leaders, a push that has made many employees angry, and which has further amplified already existing tensions between workers and those who hire, fire, and manage them. A quick aside before we get deeper into the remote work-focused element here, though. There are quite a few variables contributing to these tensions between employers and employees right now, including but not limited to concerns about the use of AI technologies and how they might replace workers, concerns about the long-term viability of some companies as those technologies arise and as economic conditions shift, concerns more directly related to those larger economic conditions, which summed up concisely stem from the transition from a low interest rate environment into a high interest rate environment, making it a lot more expensive to borrow money, which has in turn flipped many industries from a mass hiring, high spending stance into a more austere stance in which they're trying to save money, reorient toward profits, and generally firing anyone they think they can get away with firing. There are also labor union-related disputes, concerns about equity and equality, discussions and debates about things like time off after having a kid, healthcare-related concerns, all sorts of issues that are broadly connected to a larger-scale transition in how people are employed, how the economy is doing, the emergence of new tools, and cultural shifts that prioritize or deprioritize various kinds of labor, handicaps, life phases, individuals, and everything else. There's a lot of change in the air, in other words, and that's leading to changes in the hiring and firing market. But it's also raising concerns about potential further changes in the near future, which seems to be generating additional friction, and in some cases preemptive power and resource grabs by the involved entities. Bobbing around within and connected to other elements contained in that larger pool of concerns, though, is this issue of remote work. Working remotely generally means being able to work from home, though sometimes it just means not having to come into the office, and increasingly, not having to come into the office every single day. So maybe you work from your kitchen table or home office, maybe you work from a local coffee shop or a co-working space, Maybe you live near an office your company still operates and commute there a few times a week or a few times a month, or maybe you live in a completely different country, possibly meeting up with your team a few times a year and possibly only ever engaging virtually. One of the primary benefits folks who once worked at an office but who are now able to work from home most or all of the time often cite when asked about why they prefer the remote work setup is that they no longer have to commute to and from a second location each day. The time, energy, and resources saved 
by not having to get in a car or on a bus or train each morning, and then doing the same in reverse each evening, cannot be overstated. Even people with relatively moderate commutes lasting 10 or 15 minutes each way reclaim a not unsubstantial amount of time from this kind of change. And that's not even including the additional labor related to dressing up, eating and showering at specific times, and other sacrifices and investments of that nature. Many remote workers also celebrate their ability to make and eat food at home, saving money and allowing them to eat healthier if they choose to do so, rather than being limited to whatever they can pack in a brown bag lunch or grab from a fast food place near their place of work. And others focus on the quality of life benefits associated with having that additional time and physical adjacency to their pets, their family, and their stuff, their workout equipment, their own bathroom, their backyard, their books. A lot of these purported benefits seem a little fiddly and specific and even silly in isolation, but in aggregate, the work-life balance enjoyed by folks who are allowed to work from home and who lean into that ability have been immense. And this is why survey after survey has shown that folks who have been able to live this way and who are then asked whether they would be willing to go back to working from an office or other second location workplace every single day have in very large majority scale numbers said that they would rather quit or be fired than go back to the way things were. Some data suggests that people would be willing to take an average of a 10% pay cut in order to retain their work from home benefits. And others have shown that companies that are reorienting toward at office work situations are having trouble hiring young people in particular. Young people simply do not want to go into the office the way their elders had to. When the pandemic sparked remote work pivot began a few years ago, many companies went all in thinking, this was a chance to save money on rent and to offer remote work as a sort of benefit that would help them compete to get the best people, or even allowing them to hire folks away from their competitors, while also filling their own ranks with employees, some of which they needed in the moment and some they would probably need at some point in the future, as they continued to scale up in a cheap debt, blitz-scaling focused environment. After those announcements, some people, especially those living in big, expensive cities with high costs of living, moved elsewhere, to other cities, sometimes more remote areas, sometimes just less expensive ones. And that meant hauling their whole lives to this new location, maybe putting their kids in a new school, saving money probably, maybe getting a better quality of life for the price they pay, but also going through that whole moving process, which is seldom fun and not something that you typically want to do many times in a row in rapid succession. Some of these companies have since reneged on that offer, though, on that benefit, and are now demanding their employees come into the office maybe three times a week, maybe for the whole of the work week, and that has left these employees in a tough spot. Google Management, for instance, recently announced that they would start enforcing a three days a week at the office policy they originally announced in mid-2022. And company leadership has said this hybrid model has worked well. And they've also said their tracking of employee badge swipes will allow them to figure out who is adhering to the policy and who is not moving forward, suggesting that there's been a lot of wiggle room in this for a long time and that they anticipate issues in getting people to stick to it once it's become a sterner, hard, fast rule. Corporate employees at Amazon recently staged a walkout to protest the company's demand that they come into the office at least three days a week. About a thousand people attended that walkout in person, with a large number of employees at other Amazon campuses attending virtually, which is interesting and somewhat ironic. Facebook parent company Meta recently pulled a similar move, asking its employees to come into the office at least three days a week beginning the first week of September. Though Meta Corporate did say that employees designated as remote workers could continue working from wherever they liked. Though that is a designation other similarly sized companies have since backtracked on. So we will see how long that particular exclusion lasts. 
and Salesforce has been taking more of a carrot rather than a stick approach to incentivizing in-office work, telling employees that the company would donate $10 to a local charity on their behalf for each day a given employee comes into the office during a preset trial period in mid-June. The general heavy-handedness of many of these new policies and demands was arguably incentivized and enabled by that earlier mentioned shift from a low interest to a high interest economic environment. As it became more expensive to get debt, companies shifted to a cost saving, profit earning mode, away from a stance focused on burning through borrowed money to expand their moat and capture a larger customer base before their competition can. That meant it was suddenly okay in many industries to start firing people rather than hiring. It was actually seen as a feather in their cap rather than an indication that things might not be going well internally to start firing people because it suggested the CEO was willing to play hardball to survive and thrive in this new high interest rate environment. And the C-suite of many companies consequently took to this truncation with gusto laying off huge swaths of their employee base and threatening those who didn't come back into the office with more firings because they kind of needed to fire more people as a cost savings measure anyway. Power had shifted back toward the employers over the employees, in other words, which was a big pivot from the previous pandemic era dynamic of employees suddenly having more options and thus more negotiating leverage. Those in charge at companies like Salesforce and Meta have released all sorts of press releases and data attempting to justify their efforts to pull people back into the office. Many of these justifications orient around some flavor of the idea that people work better in person and the company culture develops faster. People build relationships with each other, feel more fulfilled by the community and company culture, and generally work better as teams when they can quickly stop by each other's office or have lunch with each other, rather than setting up Zoom meetings or engaging via non-synchronous technologies like texting or email. There may be some truth to this. Data is sparse on the subject and seems to vary wildly from industry to industry and even company to company, but there are some elements of work that seem to go a lot faster and function a lot better when people engage with each other physically rather than digitally. And there are quite a few downsides associated with the dominant communication and work tools we use virtually, including the amplification of loneliness and depression-related symptoms, and a possible tendency for people to engage in more unhealthy behavior, from day drinking to drugs, when they don't have that community of people and a concrete daily schedule, chosen or otherwise, to help moderate their habits. There's also evidence, however, that this is highly dependent on workplace norms, and in at least one case, that of finance world people at one firm in the UK not being at the office can do wonders for reducing the number of illegal or questionable things people tend to do, presumably because not being around other people doing pseudo-illegal things makes it less likely that you will be sucked up into their bad and sometimes illegal ideas and schemes. And that's something that might be an individual-based thing, but it might also be a company culture amplified sort of thing. Not being close to those who are perpetuating that company culture might help you behave better if said company culture is known for doing bad things. There's also a good amount of research showing that people are often a lot happier and healthier working from home in part, as I mentioned before, because they have more time to spend with their family and friends throughout the day and because of that time saved not having to commute, and in part because they can make their own meals, work out whenever they want, and generally engage in other routines and habits that are trickier to do when you're working in an office building or around other people, not at your own home. It's somewhat a matter of having control over one's time then, rather than being at someone else's whims. And it's somewhat related to work-life balance, which seems to suffer substantially when people are required to go to a second location five days a week. And though there are downsides to working from home away from one's colleagues and the community that can sustain, the fact that so many employees are protesting for their right to keep their remote work setups and in some cases even quitting or threatening to quit if that possibility ever arises at their workplace, speaks volumes about who benefits most from the denial of such setups.
There's data indicating that 34.8% of U.S. employees worked from home on an average day as of 2022, which is down from nearly 40% in 2021, but still sky high compared to the 23-ish percent that was common until the pandemic knocked many of our previous paradigms off their axes. But layoffs continue across large, broad portions of the global economy, and economics remain tumultuous and uncertain. There's a good chance if the higher-ups at these big employers want folks to return to the office, employees will have few safe and financially secure options beyond giving in, lest they risk unemployment in an increasingly employer-favoring state of economic affairs. We are seeing a trend of smaller companies, especially smaller tech companies, but also other working-at-a-computer-all-day-centric companies of a moderate scale, using remote work as a perk to offer new employees, in some cases managing to steal skilled workers away from bigger, spendier tech giants that can pay them more in the process, because those giants are refocusing on in-office setups, while the smaller firms can remain flexible. The degree to which some companies' return to office demands are about productivity versus being about control and accountability remains in question. As research has shown both sides have pros and cons, and in terms of raw output and success, both approaches have their share of accolades and accomplishments as well. It may also be that the macro-scale economy decides a lot more about how things progress in this space than the ebbs and flows within individual firms and industries, as a pivot back toward a low-interest situation where cheap debt once again flows could return things closer to where they were previously, making mass hirings rather than mass firings the norm, and putting some portion of the power employers currently wield back in the hands of their, on average at least, remote work favoring employees. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here on Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also become a member at understandery.com, supporting all of my projects at once. And you can find an array of one-off support options at let's know things.com slash support. A huge thanks to everyone who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. This book is kind of hit and miss. There are parts of it that I found to be less useful than others. There are parts that are strange meanderings and sort of creativity-themed almost poetry of varying quality, but there are some parts that are quite deep and quite good, and the author, of course, even though he had a ghostwriter write it with him, the author is a very well-known producer of music, responsible for a great deal of the biggest names in music in recent history. And so he knows a thing or two about that which he's talking about. And this book, if nothing else, is a good meditation and a collection of thoughts and ways of thinking about the act of creativity and what it means to create. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of The Creative Act by Rick Rubin. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript of this and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other news-focused podcast, One Sentence News, wherever you get your podcasts or at onesentencenews.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and YouTube and at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.